very good morning to all of you so the last four classes we will be looking at a new topic um, a very important topic for practical engineering applications uh, which is the turbulent uh, convective heat transfer okay so although we do not have too much of time uh, since we were covering other topics most of this semester. So, we will spend at least 4 lecture hours to emphasize the nature of turbulent convective heat transfer uh, because most of the practical uh, applications that you are all dealing with I am sure are turbulent in nature. And, uh, uh, I am also sure that uh, many of you are already taking a course on uh, you know some introduction to turbulence or turbulence modeling or part of this is already being covered in a fluid mechanics course. Okay. Um, but the approach in heat transfer is very similar except that uh, for simple applications, simple arguments we will use certain analogies. And uh, one analogy which we have already shown for the laminar um, external forced convection is the Reynolds analogy. So, we saw that since the structure of the momentum and energy equations are uh, very similar. So, once you get the expression for skin friction coefficient we can directly <coughs> derive the expression for Nusselt number using the Reynolds analogy. So, to start with uh, the simplistic uh, kind of arguments in heat transfer turbulent heat transfer state that we can actually use certain analogies like these like the Reynolds analogy we can extend these analogies to turbulent flows also okay. and uh, reasonable accuracy they give uh, you know in a very less time you can get a good prediction of the um, local Nusselt numbers and things like that without having to solve them rigorously using computational methods. Okay. So, let us uh, quickly look at the corresponding range of the flow parameters which will classify the flows as either laminar or turbulent and as you all know in the force convection case this is the Reynolds number. So, if you look at uh, external flows. Okay. So, we use the definition of Reynolds number say so, let us say local Reynolds number and generally if this local Reynolds number is greater than 5 into 10 power 5 this is for the flat plate. So, the flow tends to change from the regular streamline laminar pattern to a more chaotic turbulent pattern. Okay. So, similarly if you go to internal flows, so let us say flow through a duct. So, we use the Reynolds number based on the diameter of the duct and typically if this is greater than say 2300. So, the flow is said to be turbulent and what about the natural convection. So, in natural convection how do we classify what will be the parameter huh? we can either use Grashof number or Rayleigh number. Okay. So, generally people use Rayleigh number which is the product of Grashof and Prandtl number and if you take the case of a flat plate or a cavity an enclosure. So, typical values of Rayleigh number greater than 10 power 7 these are classified. So, this could be a vertical plate or enclosure cavity this is the natural convection in a cavity. 
So that is why in the project I have asked you to work at Rayleigh numbers less than 10 power 7 okay so up to 10 power 6 it is still laminar. Now what happens if you cross these thresholds either Reynolds number or Rayleigh number. So when you put a probe okay so typically it could be um, a hot wire probe which is used to measure the local velocity instantaneous velocity at a particular point suppose you have the flat plate okay so let us say that till certain position where your Reynolds number is less than 10 power 5 so this is where our Blasius solution and everything is applied okay so now after 5 into 10 power 5 you have a small transition zone in which instabilities will start will change the pattern of flow okay so once these instabilities start you will find that now the turbulent region where Reynolds number is greater than 5 into 10 power 5 you will see motions which are definitely not streamlined and not only that you will see several structures several large eddies eddies of all length and time scales okay so large eddies typically and of a definite structure these are called coherent structures okay now you can have length scales which are quite disparate right from you know order of uh, magnitude to 5 or 6 orders of magnitude difference in the length scales depending on the Reynolds number okay. So the smallest uh, eddy will be naturally lying closer to the wall okay. So as you go from the turbulent boundary layer edge towards the wall the size of the eddies will naturally become smaller and smaller and finally close to the wall the flow will be only laminar okay. So essentially near the wall you have the effect of viscosity which is molecular viscosity which is predominant as compared to the turbulent motion and therefore this will be referred to as the viscous sublayer or laminar sublayer okay. So now the action of the wall therefore is to damp the effect of turbulence okay. So without the confinement without the wall you do not have a laminar sublayer therefore and you only have a range of scales in turbulent flow. So in the case of a typical boundary layer profile the effect of wall is to damp the large scales and finally the large scales cascade to smaller and smaller eddies and finally it becomes laminar close to the wall okay. Now only in this laminar region you have the significant effect of molecular viscosity. So outside this it is all turbulent and the turbulent motion will dictate the velocity profile, temperature profile and the characteristics of flow field and temperature field okay so the effect of molecular viscosity and thermal conductivity will not be significant outside the viscous sublayer okay so, so this is a very very interesting um, um, you know uh, physical phenomena mainly because it's very challenging to observe so many length scales and also we have therefore different regimes different regions where the effect of um, the molecular viscosity can be significant and in other places where it is insignificant okay. So now if you therefore look at these uh, structures so what do we how do we capture these different length scales. So if you put a probe for example um, let us say a hot wire probe and try to measure the velocity at a point here so how do you see the variation with respect to time okay so let us plot velocity versus time so you might start with some value at time t equal to 0 and then you might see some fluctuations 
<laughs> could be anything, but you will definitely see a lot of fluctuations like this. It could be periodic, need not be periodic. Okay. Now this measurement is called the instantaneous velocity. That means this is at a particular point and over a time instant that you keep monitoring continuously okay, and you do not apply any filter to this. So whatever comes out to the probe and if the probe is quite sensitive, you have to be important that pay attention that the probe is sensitive to all the time scales of turbulence and therefore it should be able to resolve these fluctuations. Okay. Now these fluctuations represent that there is inherent turbulence in the flow field. Okay. In a laminar case you would not see this fluctuations, it will be a constant value at that point in time. Okay. So initially there could be some unsteadiness, but finally once it reaches a steady state condition it will not change, but in the turbulent case there is nothing like a true steady state, there will be always an inherent fluctuation that you will observe. And therefore, um, so this represents the nature of you know, turbulent uh, flow regime. Now that you can capture this, the how do we then post process? So what we do usually is take an average of this readings, okay. So we can classify this entire instantaneous data into an average and a fluctuation about the mean. Okay. So there we can assume there is a fluctuation which will represent as u prime, it could be positive or negative about the mean and therefore we can decompose the instantaneous velocity as a fluctuation which we will represent uh, is an average which will represent by an over bar. This average can also be a function of time, we will see that plus you have the fluctuating component. So this is a simpler way of basically representing the instantaneous velocity because the instantaneous velocity has too much of data which we may not need. Okay. So in order to simplify um, the and post process and also um, solve the equations, we look at the mean velocity and a fluctuation about this mean and therefore we assume saying that the instantaneous velocity is equal to sum of the mean and the fluctuation. So now this mean velocity also can be a function of time depending on that kind of filter that you apply. So when we say mean velocity here, how do we calculate this mean velocity? This is nothing but integral some time t to t plus delta t u of t dt 1 over delta t. Okay. So we can do some kind of an averaging, in this case I have done what is called as a time average. Okay. So we can average the instantaneous component over a period of time with a certain filter with this which is delta t here and we can if you do this average you get what what is the what the mean velocity we have represented here okay now if you apply the filter carefully enough for example if you have an instantaneous velocity something like this so some kind of waviness which comes in time, but it is periodic and repeatable. So if you apply the averaging filter carefully, you should be able to construct a pattern which is repeating and periodic, understand. So these are not small fluctuations, so you should distinguish the waviness which is actually the time variation of the mean velocity from the fluctuation which is your RMS velocity or root mean square velocity. So if you plot the instantaneous velocity here and if you carefully apply the time filter okay, such that this time filter is 
smaller than the waviness okay so suppose this is your time scale of the unsteadiness so your delta t should be definitely smaller than this if you apply a delta t larger than this time scale you will be only getting something like this right so it has to be smaller than the waviness time scale but it should be larger than the fluctuating time scale okay so these are the time scales of fluctuation which you want to smooth out so in order to smoothen the um, fluctuations you need to apply a filter which is larger than the fluctuating time scale but smaller than the time scale of the unsteadiness okay so if you select that delta t appropriately then you should be able to reconstruct uh, u mean which is actually a function of time so this is showing that there is a periodic unsteadiness in the flow pattern the mean flow itself and this is coming after you apply the appropriate smoothing and therefore the correct representation will be to say that an instantaneous velocity can be decomposed into a mean which is a function of time okay plus the fluctuating component now there are different ways of uh, doing this averaging so what i have described here is time averaging you can also do what is called as um, ensemble average that means you take um, certain data at a certain location you take it repeat it again you repeat it again you repeat it again so you have several sets of data okay and then do a statistical averaging of all these different repetitions <coughs> so that is called as ensemble average okay anyway so for the simple cases of and also considering um, incompressible flow regime people say that doesn't matter whether you take a time averaging or ensemble averaging they both lead to the same set of equations okay so we don't have to worry too much about this for incompressible flows for compressible flows we do what is called as favre average that means we also have to account for the variation of density okay with time and also the fluctuation of density whereas in incompressible flow we assume that density is constant although there is a turbulence the turbulence is affecting only the velocity and temperature not the density the density as a property is constant okay whereas in a compressible flow the density also has fluctuations so therefore uh, we have to average rho u for example in compressible flow not just u okay so th this is called favre averaging which we will not be worrying about here you can also do what is called as spatial averaging <coughs> so you can use a filter which is not time but the um, grid size for example so this is typically done in what is called as large eddy simulations okay so you use a spatial filter which is actually the grid size which can resolve the which can actually resolve um, the smallest eddy possible beyond that all the smaller eddies have to be modeled so you apply typically in les the spatial filter is the grid size delta okay so like this you can talk about different ways of doing this average but nevertheless after you average you say that the instantaneous component is therefore a superposition of the mean component and the fluctuating component so like this if you do the averaging so how should you model or how should you capture all these uh, scales so as you can see that these fluctuations are a result of the small eddies okay so the time scale of these eddies are resulting in this fluctuation so therefore how do you really resolve this so for this what we do is generally the most generic case we solve the navier stokes equation as it is okay and we should be able to when you solve navier stokes as it is meaning there is no analytical solution to that we only do it numerically but we use a grid size which can actually resolve all the length scales length and time scales 
Okay, so this kind of treatment is called direct numerical simulation. So popularly referred to as the DNS. So this is the precise, most precise way. That means we just take whatever Navier-Stokes equation because they are valid irrespective of whether the flow is laminar or turbulent and solve them exactly but the only constraint is how much you can actually physically resolve, numerically you can resolve. Okay. So that is limited by the grid size but you should understand that this is not very trivial because most of the times the ratio of the largest eddy to the smallest eddy can be greater than 10 power 3. Okay. So the smallest length scale is called the Kolmogorov length scale. The largest length scale could be of almost the size of for example here it could be almost comparable to the boundary layer thickness itself. Okay. The smallest length scale is the length scale before which it finally gets dissipated into heat. Okay. So therefore this is called the Kolmogorov length scale and if you have if you if you plot what is called the energy spectrum. So usually when you are doing a DNS the first thing that you are asked to show is, is the energy spectrum that means it tells you how much turbulent length scales turbulent energy spec scales have you resolved okay, with your grid. So you will be able to show a energy cascade. Okay. So that shows that the energy is kinetic energy turbulent kinetic energy is transferred from the largest uh, scales finally to the Kolmogorov scales okay. and finally that energy is dissipated as heat at the wall due to the viscous dissipation. Finally the all these turbulence turbulent momentum coming from the larger eddies is actually handed over to the smaller and smaller eddies and finally the smallest eddy will dissipate this there is nothing else to dissipate take away this energy from the eddy so but it dissipates itself into heat due to viscous dissipation effects at the wall. Okay. So generally when you do a DNS you plot the energy spectrum and show that you have resolved all the energy scales of turbulence right from the largest scale to the smallest scale and this length scales can be at least 10 power 3 the ratio of the largest to the smallest length scale. So that means you should have a grid size which is 3 orders of magnitude difference. So if you are therefore doing uh, a, a domain which is 1 meter the smallest grid size should be of the order of 1 millimeter. Okay. This is an example right. So that means you should have enough grids to resolve anything from 1 millimeter all the way to 1 meter okay. and sometimes it even falls sub millimeter scale okay. 10 power 4 if it goes 10 power 5 it goes you are actually resolving micron scale eddies. Okay. So this becomes a very very challenging task especially in 3 dimensions this I am talking about in 1 dimension okay. if you need resolution in turbulence is inherently 3 dimensional so if you are doing a 3 dimensional simulation then it will be really a humongous task you are talking about mesh size of 1 billion typically okay. so to do even basic um, turbulent simulations. So which will be very very computationally challenging so therefore the alternate option is doing some other ways like larger dissimulation or the more practical method which is called the Reynolds average. So I think what we will do is spend the next um, lectures only discussing about the practical method which is the Reynolds deriving the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation and then how do we find simple solutions to the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. So now 
I mean the Reynolds averaging assumes first you decompose your instantaneous velocity into the mean and fluctuating velocity. So this is called as Reynolds decomposition. So this is the starting point of deriving the Reynolds averaged Navier-Stokes equation which is also popularly referred to as the Rand's equations. Now before we do this uh, we also have to decompose all the flow parameters not only the velocity but also what are all the other things in the Navier-Stokes equation pressure for example and finally in the energy equation we have temperature you can do the same thing for V velocity also. We do the Reynolds decomposition for all the flow parameters here by constructing a filter which could be either a time wise filter on an ensemble wise filter and then we decompose that into a mean and a fluctuating component. Now before we do the derivation there are certain rules that we have to list down. So I will just state what, what are called the rules of averaging. Okay. So these have to be satisfied when we apply these averaging to the entire Navier-Stokes equation. The first thing is that when you take the average of the fluctuating component that is you have a mean here now if you want to find the average of this what it will be it will be 0 okay. So that is because you take the mean of the instantaneous that should be the same as the mean velocity itself. So therefore the mean of the fluctuating component should be 0. So you have a positive fluctuation negative fluctuation so when you apply this over average it over the delta t it should cancel out. So that is the first rule and therefore what does it tell you now when we apply a mean to a mean when we average the mean component over the same delta t it should give back the same mean. So it does not matter how many times you average the, the mean component it still get, get back the same mean that means you still apply the same delta t over that okay so therefore it does not make any difference to the average okay. Now there is a product rule which states that if you take the product of mean and an instantaneous quantity okay and then you average this component you can break this into a mean of the mean which will be nothing but the mean times the mean of the instantaneous what is the mean of the instantaneous it is nothing but the mean again the mean component okay. So since because the instantaneous average is 0 so if you can substitute as u mean plus u prime okay so this will be simply u prime uh, this is u bar u bar plus you have u bar u prime since u prime average is 0 so that will be 0 okay. So the fourth rule is the summation rule which says that if you have for example two mean values you add them and then you take a mean of that it is the same as taking the, uh, the summation of two means okay. So that means if you take the sum of two means and again take a mean of that it will be the same as just uh, the, the sum of the two means independent okay. So number 5 apply for example mean to the integral so that means I am averaging the entire integral of an instantaneous component. So I have say integral u dx and I want to average this so this averaging operation applies only to this u and not to the integral okay. So this can be written as therefore what so if I apply the 
averaging to the instantaneous component it returns the mean. So, u bar dx the same thing can be applied to the differentiation operator also. So, if I say d by dx of u and then I apply the mean to this entire thing it will return d by dx of u bar okay. So, now the other component the other rule is an important rule it says that if I take for example, a product of um, the mean and the fluctuating component and if I apply the averaging of this what do you think will happen 0 because this can be split as according to the product rule u bar into u prime bar and since u prime bar is 0 so this should be 0 ok. So, these are the rules that you have to keep in hand when we start deriving the Rand's equation. So, let us quickly go over the derivation part. So, once you apply the rules it becomes much easier. So, you please write down the two dimensional steady state incompressible Navier Stokes. including the energy equation ok. So, first is the continuity all in dimensional form then the x momentum So, we are writing this only for force convection right now ok without the body force term but later on you can also derive this for the natural convection case. So, now what we will do first is apply the Reynolds decomposition ok. So, we can decompose all these are instantaneous quantities in turbulent flows ok. So, we have to therefore, do a Reynolds decomposition of the instantaneous quantities and then we have to average these equations. So, we have to apply the averaging operation over the entire equations. So, then only we get what, what are called the Reynolds averaged Navier Stokes equation. Okay. So, can you quickly do that for the continuity equation and tell me what you get. So, I have written down the Reynolds decomposition here. So, you should be able to. So, you can write the continuity equation as d by dx of u bar plus u prime d by dy of v bar plus v prime and now average of this entire equation. So, usually some textbooks follow some conventions for example, time average is given by an over bar ensemble average is given by this kind of parenthesis ok. So, you write this means it is an ensemble average ok. So, if you write like this this is time average. So, some textbooks follow this convention. So, now how do you write this use the rules of averaging and tell me So, this will be so this operator d by d x of u u bar plus u prime bar. So, that will be what d by d x of u bar. 
So, we can of course write this as like this plus du prime bar by dx plus dv bar by dy plus dv prime bar by dy. So, according to our rule this is what? This is also 0, right. So, therefore, you have a continuity equation for the mean flow field. So, there is a continuity equation which satisfies the mean velocities and therefore, there should also be a continuity equation satisfying the fluctuating component because since you have a continuity equation for the instantaneous flow field and there is a continuity equation satisfying the mean. So, if you substitute back you can actually write a continuity equation satisfying the fluctuating component also. So, the velocity fluctuations u prime v prime also should satisfy their own continuity equations. Now, please do the same thing for the x momentum equation do the Reynolds decomposition and averaging and tell me what are all the terms. So, I will parallelly do it, but you also do it on your own and then verify. So, therefore, if you look at the right hand side, this is okay, everybody must have written the step. On the right hand side, this will be this is incompressible, so there is nothing, there is no averaging operator on the density. So, 1 by rho d by dx of p bar plus pre p prime bar, p prime bar will be 0. Similarly, if you do the averaging here this is u bar plus u prime bar. So, u prime bar is also 0 similarly here right. So, therefore, on the right hand side it is straightforward. what do we have after averaging the equation you have d p bar by d x plus d square u bar by d x square plus d square u bar by dy square. So, the instantaneous quantities are now replaced only by the mean quantities. So, let us look at the left hand side first term ok. So, u bar plus u prime into d by dx So, how can we write this? We can split into four terms. So, one is u bar d by dx of u bar averaging operator applied to that plus you have uh, u bar d by dx of u prime averaging operator applied to that ok. Please remember how I am writing it ok. So, it is very careful I have not because we cannot now split the averaging operator separately to this term and this term 
okay. So, we have to first multiply these two terms and then apply the averaging operator. You understand it, okay. It is not simply something like this. So, you have this term plus into multiplied by d by dx of this, okay. There is no rule which says that this can be written as the averaging operator of over this multiplied by d by dx averaging operator applied over this, okay. We have separate rules for d by dx and separate rule for the product, not a combined rule. Okay, so, therefore, we have to first multiply the terms and then apply the individual averaging operator. So, now we will go back to the averaging rule which says that we can apply the averaging operation to these independent things. Okay. So, now we have two more terms left one is what u prime into du bar by dx whole bar plus we have u prime du prime by dx the whole bar okay so therefore now we can apply the averaging rule so what it will be for this case u bar d by dx u bar which is fine plus this will be zero so you have u bar d by dx of u prime bar which will be zero so when it comes to this now we have the last term okay we have u prime bar multiplied by du prime bar by dx but we don't have an averaging rule for that okay which says that this should be zero okay in fact when you say um, this can be actually returned if you look at it as d by dx we will see that u prime u prime and then apply the average. So, when you take the product of the fluctuating component multiply it with it itself with either u prime u prime or u prime v prime and then take the average this is not 0 you have to be very careful because this is the one which comes as turbulent stresses. So, in this case this is non zero quantity we will just write it as u prime into d u prime by d x okay. We can put the averaging there but that that does not matter so we can actually um, leave it as it is okay. So, therefore, we can just keep the averaging operator like this. So, if you take the second term we have v d by dy of so what do you think will come out of this second term on the lhs v bar, dou u bar by dou y. so we have v bar do u bar by do y that's correct the mean components will come as as they are now fluctuating component when they are multiplied with the derivative of the mean components they will be gone and you have another component which is v bar du bar by dy and the mean of this which will not, not be 0 okay. So, therefore, if you write the combined equation so on the left hand side. So, you have u bar du bar by dx plus v bar du bar by dy. So, this looks similar to the instantaneous terms convective terms plus additionally you have the term which is u bar u prime du prime by dx averaged plus v prime du prime by dy averaged the right hand side you have all the mean quantities. So, now we are going to introduce the continuity equation for the fluctuating component which says that d u prime by d x plus d v prime by d y is equal to 0. So, therefore, we can write this as 
d by dx of u prime u prime bar plus d by dy of u prime v prime bar minus what do you have d by dx of what do you have one case you have u prime du prime by dx plus what is the other term u prime dv prime by dy okay if you take u prime common then we we have actually du prime by dx plus dv prime by dy which will be satisfying the continuity for the fluctuating component so therefore this will be zero you understand so similarly i ask you to repeat the same thing for the v momentum also okay so therefore from the v momentum what do you get you have if you repeat the same averaging exercise you will have the mean components in the advection term plus you have additional terms you have u prime v prime bar plus d by dy of v prime v prime bar the other terms will be zero on the right hand side you have dp bar by dy plus nu into d square v by d x square so the, all these are mean components okay so now therefore we will stop here so in the turbulent trans equations you have similar terms in the advection component as the instantaneous but they are replaced by the mean quantities apart from that you have two additional terms on the left hand side okay so these are the u prime u prime derivative and u prime v prime derivative so if you write the y momentum equation also you get similar derivatives of the product of the fluctuating components so these can be actually taken towards the right hand side okay and they can be clubbed to the existing shear stresses the shear stresses are nothing but tau xx tau xy and so on apart from that you also have u prime u prime bar u prime v prime bar and so on so these are called as now turbulent stresses okay so although the nature of these stresses are originating from the advection term okay they are named as turbulent stresses just for the ease of you know, grouping these together so they are grouped along with the viscous st stresses and then they are called together as the total stress so it seems that there is an additional stress which is coming in turbulence but that is originating from the inertial terms and that is why when they are taken to the other side they have given a negative sign okay because they enhance the momentum so they are not in the conventional um, um, sense that they are not stresses which impede the flow so they are the ones which are actually promoting the um, the exchange of momentum and energy therefore so they have a negative sign because they are originating from the inertial terms so these are called as turbulent stresses so what i suggest you to do is do the same thing for energy equation also and see what is the reynolds averaged energy equation so tomorrow we will list down all these um, rans equations together and then see how we treat these turbulent stresses okay thank you